Hello, good morning and welcome back to the fish lot there out on the boat. What an absolutely <laughs> stunning morning. I'm blessed by being joined by oh, excess of 40 dolphins this morning. It's been about two weeks since I've been able to go out on the boat just because of the hellish weather. And already today is shaping up to be an amazing day. My plan is, is to try and find some bait. These guys I'm hoping are going to show me where the bait is. I'm imagining that these are here for the pilchards. There's the dolphin swimming around underneath the boat. Yeah, my plan today is to try and catch half a dozen to ten little pilchards and joeys and then I'm going to fish them on a float and fish with lures over a reef for hopefully pollock and bass. That's my plan. No matter how many times you see these guys, it always brightens your day. I don't know if you can tell but hopefully what they're doing. They're working round in a circle and corralling all the bait fish into the centre and then coming through on the side and hitting them with their tails. As I explained in videos before, it's, it's about watching the signs. The first thing that I saw when I come out was I saw the birds. The birds are all concentrated and all flying around in a circle. That, that told me there was something going on in that area. When I got closer and saw the dolphins, that's what it was. Look, those are all the individual fish. See them all? In fact, what they're probably doing is the fish are probably hiding underneath the hulls to get away from the dolphins. But yeah. Let's go. Well, that's what they're feeding on. Little tiny pilchards. Perfect live bait. Like you say, we've got half a dozen or ten of them. We'll be laughing. I've had to come into a deep, <laughs> deeper patch of water and I've found all the bait hanging to the seabed. I mean, 36 metres of water now. And they're all within like the last two metres right on the seabed. Hiding away from the dolphins and the birds. There's a little joey. Oh no, just a bigger one. Slightly better one. That's more like it. That's what we're after. Now that we have all the bait that we need, we'll get going to the reef. When I get there, I'll talk you through the rigs that I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using a float setup and I'm going to be either fishing with a jig or a soft plastic. I'll explain it all when we get there. We are here and it is absolutely glorious. We've had like north northwesterly winds for about 12, 18 hours and it's knocked the top right off. It has flattened everything beautifully. The only problem with that with a northerly window it is bitingly cold. The float setup that I'm going to be fishing my live baits with, it's, it's very simple. What I have is I have a conflict inshore and this is a 30 to 50 gram and I have a little spinfish alive liner and it is a four and a half thousand. On that I have, I think I have 25 pound braid and a 30 pound leader. I have a large sliding float. Onto that, when I'm not tangled up, I have a locked in lead. Now the size of the lead relates to the size of the float. Bigger float, bigger lead. Below the lead, I have a hook length of around about three to four feet of 15 pound fluoro ending in a large circle. This is a 6 0 Cox and Roll Mutsu circle. Whoa. Depending on the size of the live bits you're using, if you're using, if you're using shrimps and prawns, you can go down to a 2 0. If you're using full size joeys, 6 0s, 8 0s, that works. Don't feel like you have to go too small. These fish have got big mouths. And all I'm going to do is I'll take one of the live bits, show you what I'm I will select one of the live baits at random. There you go, chap, it's your lucky day. And you just thread it onto the hook. Now we need to be careful with this. Different people have got different methods for hooking their live baits on. You just need to make sure that you don't kill it. Because it wants to remain a live bait, it doesn't want to be a dead bait. Drop it down, let it out. And away you go. 
Now, immediately I'll get people saying, oh, how would you stop your floats? <laughs> there is a thing called a float stop, funnily enough, for stopping floats. And then what height, <laughs> what depth do you set it at? Varying depths. Depends on the reef you're fishing on. If the reef is 20 foot deep, there's no point setting it at 30 foot because you'll snag at the bottom. I just vary it throughout the day depending on where I think the fish are going to be. Set the drag. A little bit tighter than that. Perfect. Now that will just fish away. As I'm drifting over the reef, that live bait will just swim around and hopefully get smashed by a pollock or a bass. At the same time as that, I'm going to be fishing either a little soft plastic lure. This is a Conflict Elite and a slam of four and a half thousand. Yeah, four and a half thousand. Or I'll be fishing a little jig on my Conflict jigging rod. I like these little 30 and 40 gram Speed Mimic jigs. They just look like a little white bait, like a little tiny pilchards. Those two different setups lend themselves to different situations. When the tide's not as strong, I'm not going to say slack, when the tide's not as strong, I can get away with a light jig. When the tide's stronger, the little jig, you can't stay in contact with it. So you need to go to the other rod with the heavier, with the heavier lures, the soft plastics. The soft plastics, the jigs, you jig them, hence the name jig, they bounce around. Whereas the soft plastics, generally you cast them and then sink and draw and wind them in so they swim. So two different, two different setups for two different situations. All the while the live bait is fishing along on a float. I do, do love this type of fishing. There's something about going back to basics, about fishing with a float, about watching a float. It doesn't matter if you're coarse fishing or you see fishing. I, yeah, I love it. Some, <laughs> something relaxing about watching a float, but also at the same time, because you're fishing with a live bait, when the live bait's reacting to what's going on, there can be some predator fish down there and the live bait will see it, so it'll start panicking and the float will start moving. Being able to see that and being like, oh, the, yeah. Hopefully I'll get to show you. We are just at the start of the tide. It's just started to move. We've just had slack water period. Anybody who's watched the videos before will know when I talk about tides. They don't, when they move from low tide to high tide, they don't move, the water doesn't move at the same speed, at the same volume throughout the whole tide. For the first couple of hours, and the last couple of hours, it's running at its slowest. At the period of low water and high water, it's called slack tide because the tide isn't moving. The period of tide, the three or four hours in the middle of the tide, is when the tides are running its fastest. At the moment, we are running at about a knot, which is good. It's a good start. The tide's going to pick up. I'm expecting that as the tide starts properly flooding, we're going to start moving at about 1.3 to 1.5 knots. That is, that's a good speed. Right. Get ready. Fishing with a float like that, you're looking for one of two things. A positive bite or a negative bite. A positive bite is when a fish comes up in the water, grabs hold of the bait and goes straight down. So you'll see the float go straight down. A negative bite is the opposite. A fish has come up and picked up the bait and swum up in the water. So it picks up the weight of the bait and the weight. So there's no weight sitting on the float, so the float lays flat. Also called a drop back bite. Now the positive bites are easier to see because they just go straight down. You know what you're looking for. A negative bite, a drop back bite, can be anything. Sometimes even fish can pick them up and the float just starts moving left or right. It starts behaving erratically. So you need to keep your eye on it. Quite often you'll find when you're drifting like this, it's going to be a positive bite. Especially from a pollock. The last time I came out, last time I came out a couple of weeks ago, I had a session doing this. It was an absolute blinder of a session. 
when you haven't been out at sea for a while you, you, you never know where the fish are you don't know where the bait fish is you don't know where the big fish are so it was, it was good I'm just going to try and find them again I've never known a winter like this it just seems to be unending heavy winds heavy winds and rainstorms because the reef that we're drifting over is very up and down it's everything from 40 meters to 10 meters I'm keeping an eye on what we're going over just because I know what <laughs> I know what depth I've set my float at if I've set my float at for example 20 feet and we go over an area that's 15 feet I know that that float is going to get stuck when it gets to the air Oh, that feels like a nice fish. Whoa. I hope you saw that bite there. That was a lovely positive bite. This fish is a really solid fish. You can feel by how heavy it's shaking, it's just dun dun. No need to rush things. <laughs> People have got the, the habit of wanting to get it to the boat as quick as possible. There's no need to rush things. But if you can see the float coming up there. Wanting to be back down. Just gradually bringing the fish up to the boat. It wants to go back, it wants to go back. So you don't have to panic about gaining too much line on it too soon. Because we're drifting at, at the moment, we're drifting at 1.6 knots. So we're actually taking this fish with us at 1.6 knots. So the fish is moving. Oh, that is a beautiful pollock. It's a really nice fish. In the net, in the net. Ha! Wow. It's always nice to get the first fish. Get the first fish under your belt. That is a cracker of a fish. Perfectly hooked with the circle as well. There's the circle hook right in the corner of the mouth look what about that one that is a really heavy set fish and there's the rig it was caught on right let me just show you this here watch beauty of circle hooks right in the corner of the mouth that wasn't coming out. There you go, pop. This is why you don't need to worry about using a big circle. Holding fish like this, my hand doesn't come in contact with the gills. It just slides up inside of the gill cover. You don't want your fingers to come in contact with the gills because it doesn't do the fish any favors. You see there, look how fat its belly is. This fish here is full of raw, full of eggs. Glad to see you. It's a cracking stamp of fish. This fish is about, I'd give it between six and eight pound. 
straight back. In fact, actually, I angle you back this way. Straight down. Right. <laughs> I'll talk to you about that as well. Certain types of fish, when you can tell that they're ready to go back, like that one there, its gills were flared, its fins were up, it was tensing in my hands, I could feel it tensing. That fish is ready to go straight back. In that case, it's often best to kind of torpedo them in head first. That way they get a burst of oxygenated water over the gills and it spurs them on to swimming down. If I had held that fish in my hands in the water like, like you do with a carp, carp are fat and lazy. <laughs> they, they want to be kind of coerced, they want to be laid into the water so they can swim with... Po things like pollock and bass, when they're ready, when their fins are up, when they're aggressive still, just torpedo them back, get them back better. Don't chuck them back so they slap. They need to go in head first, like you'd be a diver into the water. And you saw there. I mean, we're in 42 metres of water now. That fish won't have any problem getting back down. And that was, uh, that was what took it. I'll just show you. There's nothing, nothing secret about it. Sliding float. Locked in lead. and three foot 15 pound fluoro with a circle now people will ask me and they'll say why do you use a locked in lead i will explain before standard rigs all you do is you just have a lead underneath your float so the lead can slide about as much as you want i don't like that because you remember i was talking about the drop back bites the bites where a fish picks it up and swims up in the water well with a drop back bite if you don't see the initial movement, that lead can slide all the way up the line. That fish can be swimming all the way up. It could be 10 feet, 20 feet, all the way up until your float reaches your float stop. And you will never register a bite because the fish is swimming up and the, the lead is sliding around on your line. I know that no matter what happens here, that bait is always going to be that far away from that lead. It also works a bit like a bolt rig in that it'll slide through and it'll hit and it'll hook. So it, it helps the float be more like a self-hooking rig and also you can stay in, stay in better contact with the bait. If you let it down too fast sometimes and it can swizzle around and your, your leg can go up, this stops that from happening. This is a better way of doing it. Just take my, <laughs> take my word for it. Anyway, let's go around and try again. The drift there, we went through a real fast area. And we went up to like 1.8 knots. I might, that might be the last drift I get to use that little jig for. And I'm going to have to step up to the soft plastic. Just because the jig, I can't stay in contact with it. You want to try and fish it vertically. And as soon as it starts getting an angle like that, you can't fish it properly and you just get snagged and you just lose them. And I don't like losing gear. I've looped round to drift back down over the reef. And I've put another live bit on. Saw the size of that pollock there. They've got absolutely no no problem smashing a decent sized live bait. The only issue that you might have is that live baits can be quite fickle and quite fragile. So you need to be quite gentle with them. These conflicting shores, these are cracking rods. Really good value for money. Uh, well, I've had some fantastic fish. Uh, I've taken them all over the world as well. I started off with just the one of them and I liked it that much that I bought, I think I've got three or four of them now. Four including the Elite. Yeah, everything from Blue Sharks to, I took this to Florida and I had Bonito on it. I've um, yeah, Bonito on the shore with lures, Bonito off the boat. I, I, I had a 14 pound conger rail on this thing as well, by accident. I was fishing for rays with it. And the little spin fishes you can't fall off. Now the reason why I got the live liner function was for fishing for bream. So I could sit it like that and it could take drag off. It works perfect for this. I like them quite long as well. I mean you can see that there that's probably seven and a half foot. When you're fishing with a float on the boat, having having like a longer rod's advantageous. Not only does it keep the line up out the way, but also like when you when you're dealing with a fish beside the boat like that and you've got a long trace because I've got 
that what 12 inches of locked in lead and then three or four feet if a fish is diving around the boat I can maneuver it with a longer rod yeah we're really drifting now we're everything between 1.6 and 1.9 knots I might even have to go to a different part of the reef if this keeps increasing Just because you can't fish the baits properly Boat's down. Oh, is it going? Is it going? Yep. Got it eventually. Now, this fish was playing with that. I saw the float bobbing and moving. This is a powerful fish. You can see how it's holding, it's just holding down there and then zzz. again like I was saying you don't need to go mad. Just hold pressure on it. And when it wants to come, when you can gain line, gain line. And a couple of real solid runs. Which making me think it's a pollock. I like that. That type of like raggedy bite where it was just the float was bobbing and flapping around is more of like a bassy bite. But yeah, those runs it does feel like a pollock. Here's the float. That is another belting pollock. <laughs> another really solid fish. There you go. Cracking fish. Again, there's the rig that it was caught on. Oh, 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 easy tiger, easy tiger. And there's the hook look just in the corner of its mouth. You ready? There's the hook. <laughs> Trying to get a shot of it without a load of shadow on it. See what I mean about all the fins being up? Better to go straight back. There you go. Yeah, that bite, the float, instead of going straight down, was going. And that was probably the pollock coming round, swinging round the bait and making the bait get agitated. And then a couple of strikes and it was down. Oh. It's going to have one more drift like this, just because the drift's getting really fast now. Yeah, we might have to move somewhere else. I would like a bass. The pollock, every pollock, both pollock that we've seen so far today have been really full of raw, full of eggs. Um, yeah, it's not ideal taking them when they're, when they're just about to spawn. If we catch one of them and it won't survive being returned, so if it's hooked deep in the gills or for whatever reason it doesn't go back, I will gladly take it. But I would rather just have one bass of about four or five pounds. This, this fish minnow that I'm using is quite heavy now. I think it's about 60 grams. Just got to because we're, we're drifting that fast. 
it's just about figuring it out about putting together all the pieces of the puzzle around oh, float, float down it's still down Ooh. might have missed our chance there that was a really jagged bite that's what it is it's bass it's a little bass you can see there look well it's still alive but you can see down this side there's some damage where it's been hit not yet Another lovely fish by the feel of it. I was just about to say I'll make this my last drift on this part of the reef. There's a the lure in his mouth. Now that one took on the retrieve. See, all I do was bouncing on the bottom. Get out. All I was doing was bouncing on the bottom and then winding up so the lure was swimming up in the water when this guy took it. Now this is actually, this is the prime, prime size for me to take for a fillet. Get a really good size fillets off these guys and I'm actually I'm going to take this one real good quality healthy fish not too big not too small perfect I'll dispatch and bleed that fish and I'll fillet it off before we go in but yeah I'll have that one for tea well, I've come to a different part of the reef and I'm looking at about 1.4 knots now, so we'll see how that goes with it. <sighs> Missed it. You greedy son. There you go. The reason why I've chosen to use this lure is because I feel like it, it imitates pilchard. There's not much difference between them, is there? Been a while for a fish. <laughs> Glad to see it. Wouldn't like to call it. Might be a balanrass. A very pretty balanrass. There's the lure. There you go. <laughs> I don't really like catching rats on these soft plastics because they just chew them to pieces. Yeah, them rats, they generally they chew these <laughs> they chew these layers up. Eat them like Haribo. 
see how fast we <laughs> get some idea of how fast we're drifting now. Two point one knots over this bit. We're in a position now where the tide is just running too fast on this reef. We we got all the way up to like 2.1, 2.2 knots there. So yeah, what I might try and do is I might try and explore another little bit, another little bit of reef, and then come back to where as the tide drops off. Just all about kind of planning your day on what the tide's doing at that point in time. You can't fish the same place all the way through the tide, and it fished the same all the way through the tide. Yeah. That feels like a good one. <laughs> yeah. This feels like a nice one. Smashed it as well. Just that little bit of a move. Only moved a couple hundred metres. Just finding where they are on the reef. And like I said, there's, there's no need to no need to force them, no need to go mad and try and drag them to the boat straight away. Because we're uh, we're drifting at 2.4 knots now. So if, if I start pulling real hard on that fish in this direction with the extra tide, you end up pulling hooks out of fish. I'd almost said to myself, I was like, oh, I'll have my sandwiches now. Wait for this tide to drop a bit. Well, you... This fella must have just had extra weight bigs this morning. He must have just had his extra weight bigs this morning because he scrapped well above his weight. It's not that I'm ungrateful because I'm really pleased to see him. But he scrapped like a much bigger fish. There's the Lord just in the corner of his mouth. I do love catching pollock like this. Go on, out you come. Out comes the hook. Belter. He's got a flap of his tail and he's away. Yeah. God, swelly bit of water. And see, look, as, as the water's come over the reef, it's created like a load of turbulence. That's the area where we are now. We're in the, we're in the confused area. Found you. Found you. I knew they had to be there. The place where we are right now is that spot where I kept getting all those funny bites with the float. And I've just come back at a different state of tide. And they're all just sitting behind one rock. Just being able to get the get the lure down there to work it. That's another lovely solid fish. Yeah. Fantastic stamp of fish. Can you hear it crunching? They've got teeth around the front and teeth right at the back of the throat, and it's crunching the ones at the back of its throat. Yeah. There's the lure right in the corner of his mouth. A beauty of a fish. Aye, aye, aye. Well, there you go. And the benefit of fishing light inshore like this 
plane up to the boat gradually is you can do this with them. If you'd caught that fish in deep water, if you'd caught that fish in like 60, 80 metres of water, it would have been dead by the time it reached the boat. Because pollock suffer really badly with barotrauma, like the bends, which is what divers get. They can't handle the change in pressure and the swim bladders blow. But when you're fishing shallow water like this, and you bring them to the boat gradually, like what I did, you can release them. So you can be selective with the fish that you take. <laughs> we topped out with 2.9 knots there. Too fast. Look at that, 16 metres. Book floats down. And it's a fish. Uh, stick you in there for a second. Get this up out of the way. <laughs> right, we're well back to it. Coming up to a coming up to a rough bit and I didn't want to lose the lure on the bottom. Just as before, like I said, drifting at 2.2 knots now. So this fish we're we're tiring this fish out by dragging it with the tide. Also, what you'll find, it's called planing. Just by pulling this fish through the water, it will be bringing it up towards the surface. <laughs> you can't help but love it, can you? This feels like a pollock. You just keep a bend in the rod. See, I'm just constantly keeping tension on the fish, keep a bend on the rod. Hopefully that's to keep the hook in the fish. Because it might only be really lightly li like lip hooked. In which case you need to keep a bend on it. Otherwise, the slack might create the hook to fall out. Turn you over so you can see the float coming. Come on, back you from, back you from. In the net. <laughs> I'll talk to you about that in a second as well. You see people sometimes chasing the fish with a net. What an absolute beauty. Real side fish. Really healthy gut on it. This one actually has not got as much spawn in it as all the other ones. I don't know if you can see the circle hook in there. It's just inside the corner of its mouth. Yeah, that's a good eight pound fish. What a cracker. And what you can do is if you're very, very gentle, the same way that my fingers are slid up the inside of the gills, put them in and you can turn the hook he says <laughs> when I can get hold of it don't too much tension on it there you go by going in through the gills I'd managed to turn it round and all I had to do was just pull it straight out I don't know if you can see them little lice on its body or on the back of its head. Yeah. Back we go. I'll get 
don't. He went, he went down and come up and I went down again. Yeah, I'll talk to you about, call it chasing it with a net. Right, fish swim forwards. They don't very often swim backwards. I think the only fish that can swim backwards is an eel. So when you're going to go and try and get them up with a the net, there's no point trying to get them from their tail. Because all they'll do is, if this is your net, and <laughs> you're coming that way, they just swim away from it. So you chase it. What you need to do is get them going. If this is your fish, there's no point going up from behind it because all it does is it thinks, oh no, and it swims away. You need to get them going head first into the net. You just scoop them up. Oh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I've just come in here and I put a live bit out. I'm just going to fill it that pollock. And I thought, I'll tell you what, I'll just drop this jig down and see what's down there. Yeah, it's been <laughs> about 10 seconds down there. I'm into a fish. I think this is a case of that one more cast. Beautiful looking fish. Within seconds, the gullies are here. <laughs> Wasn't a seagull in sight, and yet within seconds, they're here. There we go. That fish actually had quite a few worms in its flank. Like all inside the belly cavity here. So I just took the flanks off. There you go, they've both been V-boned. No bones, no mess. And yeah. The rest can go to the crabs. Now I'm going to have to be sharp because I want to get back in in time. James has got a football match this after. I hope you've enjoyed joining me. I hope you found it interesting. All the very best. See you later.